Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. And I am meeting you once again with lecture 19 of drama 2, that is modern drama. We are doing the third text of modern drama, that is Wedding for Godot by Samuel Barclay Beckett. In our previous talk, we talked about the themes and um, the use of symbolism in the drama by the writer. However, today's talk is going to explore this philosophical framework of the drama. And we are going to get into the philosophical background that results into, the, um, into this masterpiece and the influences of uh, the philosophical uh, prospects um, taken by the writer. So mainly we will talk about um, theater of absurd, existentialism, and the paradox of consciousness in order to explore um, the drama's philosophical background. We will also try to analytically map the characters playing their role in the play. So starting with our exploration of physical background, we will firstly talk about the theater of absurd by Samuel Beckett. Beckett is one of the most widely discussed and known and highly prized uh, writer of 20th century authors, inspiring a critical industry to revival, to revile that which has sprung up around James Joyce and to celebrate his uh, hundredth birthday anniversary you can see Samuel Bucket is depicted on Irish on an Irish um, a commemorative coin and shining in golden on the screen so from this you can understand how highly prized and how famous the writer was even in, in his own age and in his uh, life and this is a kind of honor that most of the writers normally do not get. So of all the English language modernist, Beckett's work represents the most sustained attack on the realist tradition. We understand when we started with modern drama, we had an analysis of the difference that marks this barrier between the, the history of drama and the trends of drama prior to modern era and in the modern era. And in that uh, mark of difference, we notice that it is basically the movement towards uh, from idealism to realism that contributes to uh, make this era stand out. So in the realist tradition, although whatever we have read so far, all of these writers have been um, promoting uh, um, the art for not art sake only, but for the reality sake concept. However, you will find the theater of absurd ex as an extreme attempt in order to promote the similar um, philosophy. Uh, Samuel Beckett more than anyone else opened up the possibility of drama and fiction that dispense with conventional plot and the units of place and time. Um, we read the drama by Ibsen, The Doll's House, we read Sean Okese, now when we are reading Beckett. So, so far you would have been able to observe that these dramas do not follow traditional structure of a drama, traditional pattern of a drama writing. They do not follow those organic holes of units of place and time. They do have a different kind of um, uniting and binding elements which are basically to focus on essential components of the human condition. So what these writers are more concerned with, not human fascination, not human idealism, not human desire, but they are more concerned with their condition. And, and then when they are more concerned about human condition, they are more concerned about what are those essential components that help in making these conditions present um, in humans' life. So, writers like Wakely, Hev uh, Wakely Hevel, John Benville, Aidan Higgins, and Harold Pinter have publicly stated um, their indebtedness to Beckett's example, but he has had a much wider influence 
on experimental writing. So he is one of the writer who can be known as a leader in writing for the realistic art for the theater of absurd. And that is why his works are considered most uh, commonly given examples of um, absurdist theater. So since the 1950s, from the beat generation to the happenings of the 1960s and beyond, he is the writer who is considered um, a leading figure into this type of art of writing. Now, uh, little know, though we already have been discussing about Samuel Beckett and the relation between the theater of absurd and the writer itself, today we are going to see what are those philosophical um, uh, frames which help the writer um, come up with uh, this drama waiting for Godot. So looking into the theater of absurd, we come to know that uh, what are those influences that made writer uh, step into this, not only this form of art, but this intense form of art because we find that it's not only um, the theater is not only touching on the realities of life but touching with all the extreme um, uh, you can say um, uh, taking all the steps to uh, make it a point to pin this down that this is what is happening in human life and the reality stands uh, strong in contrast to um, idealism so one, um, one influence that we know already that we have been discussing throughout our discussion related to modern drama is the effects of world war. We know that modern drama is produced mostly between World War I and World War II. So basically 62 million people killed, that is 37.5 million in World War I, is one of the greatest influences that writer um, could not ignore. Secondly, 12 million in concentration camps. So as, as, as we know that warfare does not affect only the people who are involved physically into the activity, it involves generation. Those who have already come, those who are there, and those who are going to come. And this warfare um, was a worse um, example of its kind as the presence of atomic bomb and the promise of annihilation destroyed generation and generations and generations and we can still in the contemporary age the effects the the destroying effects the um, horrible effects, the traumatic effects can still be observed in those places where this war had been exercised, these wars had, ha, had been exercised. So the wars are basically one of the influences that guided and motivated the writer to get into these extremes. Then altogether the philosophical backgrounds deals with um, these three dimensions it's a it's a three-dimensional uh, philosophical framework that on one end uh, deals with theater of absurd on the other end it deals with existentialism and the third is the paradox of consciousness for example, ex existentialism uh, Jane Paul Sartre uh, calls it it's although it's absurd content but rational form or presentation of that content however how the theater of absurd is different from this is that form as well as content merge to form a true art so you will find the absurdity not only in the content but in the form of the uh, art as well so that makes the clear distinction between these two philosophies let's getting into detail let us move a little more into the uh, philosophy of this theater of absurd. So basically the, the term was coined by Martin Eslin in a book of the same name, Beckett and Godot. Um, and were center, these were the center um, pieces of the book. Eslin claimed that these plays were the fulfillment of Albert Camus' concept of the absurd. This is one reason Beckett is often falsely labeled as an existentialist. 
So, um, as I explained in the last lecture, the absurd, the very word, uh, describes uh, the underlying concept of um, absurdity, of of nothingness, of um, futileness, of um, of lack of utility, of all the negative terms that can be associated with it is basically coining, helping us understand this uh, term of the absurd. So, though many of the themes are similar, Beckett had a little affinity for existentialism as a whole. Broadly speaking, the plays deal with the subject of despair and the will to survive. In spite of that despair, in the face of an uncomprehending and indeed incomprehensible word. So, what um, Beckett is adding into the already coined term um, by Aslin, that is of theatre of absurd, and he has already had a book with the same name, um, Beckett and Godot. The addition, the addition to the knowledge is um, Beckett's picture where he defines that it is not this despair uh, the main subject but it is a will to survive as well. So far absurdity or theatre of absurd or the realistic art, um, uh, these things have been dealing with the, the despair, the chaos, the ambiguity in the, in the world outside and the things which are resulted uh, into destruction. However, the additional element that uh, Beckett brings forward for us to understand is the will to survive. And if you um, take both of these uh, ideas and go back to the text of the drama and recall your memories of the characters and the plot as well, you will get to see that um, Lucky and Pozo um, Valentimir and Estragon, what they are doing all the time, although all their activities, their articulation, their language, their dialogues, the setting, everything is so forcefully depicting the subject of despair. However, in each and every action, whether it is physical or it is a mental activity that is shown in any way on the stage, is letting you understand that there is a will to survive. We need to wait for Godo. We are waiting for Godo and they keep on waiting from the first act till the end of the second act. From the very first scene till the end of the last scene, we find that they started from the wait and they are ending on the wait as well. So it's a will to survive that does not let them stop waiting. And this is one, uh, this is that ray of hope that basically Beckett cracked in his work. In spite of that despair, in spite of that chaotic situation outside, in spite of that dark, in the face of an uncomprehendable and unbelievable uh, word, still the hope remains to be the uh, one positive thing that human just cannot let go. All right. So the word, the words of Nell, one of the two characters in the um, end game who are trapped in uh, ash pins from which they occasionally peek their heads to speak, can best summarize the themes of the plays of Beckett's um, middle period. And these words are: nothing is funnier than unhappiness. I grant you that. Yes, yes, it is the most comical thing in the world. And we laugh. We laugh with a will in the beginning, but it's always the same thing. Yes, it's like the funny story we have heard too often. We still find it funny, but we don't laugh anymore. So these words from end game are basically depicting are basically conveying the theme, the funny tragedy or the comical tragic element lying in human's life that Beckett wanted to convey in his writings. Although apparently it sounds funny, but it's not funny and this element of comedy is basically it enhances the presence of tragedy in human life. And he says, nothing is funnier than unhappiness. Unhappiness sounds very funny at times. I grant you that. He says, this can be taken for granted. Yes, it's the most comical thing in the world. And we laugh. Many a times we laugh with a will 
in the beginning, however, but it's always the same thing. It's an ongoing, never-ending process and journey. Yes, it is like the funny story we have heard too often and a time comes when the realization takes place, we don't laugh anymore. So it's that moment of realization that Beckett is caught in, in this drama and he wants to share it with his audience. So, the term theater of the absurd derives from the philosophical use of the word absurd by such existentialist thinkers as Albert Camus and Jean Paul Sartre. Camus particularly argued that humanity had to resign itself to recognize that a fully satisfied rational explanation of the universe was beyond its reach. In that sense, the world must ultimately be seen as absurd. So what Camus uh, promotes in his writings basically the absurdity of human life and on the top of it absurdity of this world that um, it's like aiming at achieving something that is not possible. And uh, then basing your uh, existen existence on the same very idea it, it is like uh, expecting a logical explanation of this universe is something that is, um, you know, um, planning about uh, stepping on moon. Um, and that probably will not be a r good example because we've already stepped on moon. It's like, it's like dreaming about something that is entirely not possible. Well, um, and then this is this world is ultimately be seen as absurd and that's what the theater of absurd promotes. Now one very interesting thing about the theater of the absurd is that these playwrights can loosely be grouped under the label of the absurd endeavor to convey their sense of bewilderment, anxiety and wonder in the face of an explicable universe. Now in order to um, convey an inner reality, uh, they rely heavily on poetic metaphors as a means of projecting outward their innermost state of mind. The theater of absurd very much deals with the, with the paradox of consciousness, what is going on in human mind. So somehow you will find the theater of absurd does not only deal with the um, ugliness of appearance, it deals with the ugliness of um, uh, inner self of, hum of humanity that is definitely resulted by the ugliness of um, outward, uh, outward activities of human life. Hence the images of the theater of the absurd tend to assume the quality of fantasy, dream and nightmare. They do not so much portray the outward appearance of reality as a playwright's emotional perception of an inner quality and of inner reality. When we talk about um, human inner reality, one of the most important aspect of um, the absurd drama was then its distrust distrust of language as a means of communication. Um, the, the proponents of this school of thought basically believed that there are several other channels of communication apart language that can tell you about the inner reality of human beings. Language had become a vehicle of um, convention, conventionalized, stereotyped, meaningless exchanges. Words failed to express the essence of human experience, not being able to penetrate beyond its, its service. So language by this school of thought was considered to be a limited medium of expressing the reality of human beings. The theater of the absurd hence constituted first and foremost an uh, onslaught on language showing it as a very unreliable and insufficient tool of communication. So that is one thing that highlights in the school of thought is that the theater of the absurd uh, considers language that is normally considered as a basic um, and significant means of human communication 
it was considered an unreliable and insufficient tool of communication that does not uh, let us know what is going on inside a human being and it is it is stated the position was taken that words fail to express the essence of human experience and are not being able to penetrate beyond its surface they are limited so absurd drama wo uses conventionalized speech cliche slogans and technical jargons which is distorts um, parodies and breaks down so you will find whenever um, absurd theater um, takes its turn on language item lexical item whether it is speech or dialogue or a cliche or a slogan or a proverb or a technical jargon this will present the absurd theater will present its distorted form its parody whenever an allusion is taken in form of language whether whatever linguistic item is that whether it's a proverb or a speech item or a cliche or a jargon from past it will give you its distorted form and the reason uh, lies in its belief that language does not communicate the total reality of inner self and it is considered limited so by ridiculing conventionalized and stereotyped speech patterns the theater of the absurd tries to make people aware of the possibility of going beyond everyday speech conventions and communicating more authentically so basically this was theater of absurd that um, that attached uh, the quality of speech with silence and that is why in this particular drama wearing fogodo the pauses and silence these activities are very important because they are um, all the time substituting the medium the the quality of speech and the uh, the intention behind is that silence uh, convey most of the things which cannot be described into words so it is the unsaid is heard most than the said in Beckett's work uh, conventionalized speech acts as a barrier between ourselves and what the world is really about uh, that is the idea that Beckett's waiting for Godo promotes in order to come into direct contact with natural reality the writer says it is necessary to discredit and discard the false crutches of conventionalized language that is why you will see that there there are um, very limited dialogue spoken by the uh, characters in the drama and most of these dialogues are constant repetition and you will find that nothing much is happening inside the drama however basically it's it's a parody of its distortion of this medium of expression that is language and a lot is being said through other mediums whether it's physical movement whether it's silence or it's stage setting or it's a silent deal with between characters or its posture or physical appearance all the other uh, aspects that can be taken as medium of communication are relied more than the conventional aspect of language and speech in the theater of the absurd so objects are much more important than language in absurd theater uh, and this is shown by uh, this the objects used in the drama you will find that although the set is very simple and um, you will find that minimum items are used in the settings however they are very important that the object of tree is significant symbolic and carries the theme forward the theme of absurdity in the drama uh, what happens transcends what is being said about it it is the hidden implied meaning of words that assume primary importance in absurd theater over and above what is being actually said so absurd theater since it discards and um, disrespect this medium of expression the language to be limited it believes that what is said is less important than what is 
unsaid. So in other words, what is unsaid is more important than what is said. So probably we should get into that and try to find out the meaning of what is unsaid, then focusing our attention only to what is said. The theater of the absurd strove to communicate an undissolved totality of perception. Hence it had to go beyond language. Now why the theater of absurd deals more with silence and what is unsaid because it does not only deal with the appearance whether it's the appearance of self or it is appearance of self again in, in the presence of language. Again language is a kind of appearance that can be seen, that can be felt, that can be heard. It can be it can be associated with one sense of uh, um, you know one human sense that is hearing. So theater of absurd deals more with things which are abstract, which are which cannot be felt, which cannot be seen, which cannot be heard, since it deals with perception of human beings, perception of human reality. It does not only deal with the appearances, it deals more with things which are not on the surface. It goes beyond the uh, limitation of service into the uh, surface, into the depth of the existence. Absurd drama um, subverts logic. It relishes the unexpected and the logically impossible. In trying to burst the bounds of logic and language, the absurd theater is trying to shatter the enclosing walls of the human condition itself. This is very important aspect that you need to understand that um, the theater of absurd basically um, bursts the boundaries, whether they are boundary of appearances, boundary of logic, boundary of language, and it tries to get into the enclosed walls of human condition. It tries to find out uh, the human condition not merely by things which are apparent whether it's human language human appearance or human logic because logic is to express logic is to share it feels the the theater the philosophy conveys that things which are expressible may not be as important if you are trying to find out the human condition than to the things which cannot be ex expressible because of the ugliness of structure, the thoughts that cannot be shared because they are not joined together, because they are not coherent, are more important to know about human condition than to those thoughts that are expressible because they are into a structure, they are into form. So if you want to know about the human condition, the reality of human condition, go and find out into the uh, into those things which a human being keeps inside as trash because he thinks that only he can understand those things which are not in proper shape since he feels that things since the things are not in proper shape they cannot be shared with other human beings they cannot be shared with society and that is the barrier that the theater of absurd theater of absurd wants to cross and wants to get in because it feels that this is the right place a good on inside human self where you can go and find out things and see what meaning they have hidden inside so our individual identity is identified by language. Having a name is the source of our separateness. The loss of logic language brings us towards a unity with living things in being illogical. The absurd theater is anti-rationalist. It negates rationalism because it feels that um, rationalist thought like language only deals with this superficial aspect of things. At times when you are unable to sort out the original, the genuineness of your inner reality, you try to cope up with, you try to compromise with the, um, you know, falseness of uh, things in order to provide some shape to your inner reality. So what is genuine is at times left behind and it is at times left behind in your struggle to shape up the things in order to express it, in order to share it with people. So if we are, if we 
keep this effort of shaping up things, rationalizing thing, beautifying thing, and bringing them into some kind of standard aside for a while, probably it will be better uh, to do it so you can understand what is hidden inside, what is lying inside that gives you a genuine in look, uh, look into the uh, personality. So nonsense on the other hand, opens up a glimpse of the infinite. It offers intoxicating freedom, brings one into contact with the essence of life and is a source of marvelous comedy. So what, is, what comes out of this discussion is basically theater of absurd gives you freedom of self. No matter how nonsense you are, no matter how much sense you are, acts, whether they are physical, they are psychological, they are mental, they are making, you are free to express because in that expression there lies in your real self. And that is why uh, when your inner self is out, which is shabby, which is not in proper structure, things are jumbled up, things are upside down because that's how they are. At times in the very first contact with them, they look comic to you. They may appear um, kind of um, comedy to you, but when you will deal with them, you will look, look into them, why they are like that, you will find the real tragedy of li life lying in between there. So that is the total idea of theater of absurd that Samuel Beckett conveys. No dramatic conflict in the absurd plays. Dramatic conflicts, uh, clashes of personalities and power, powers belong to a world where a rigid, acceptable hierarchy of values forms a permanent establishment. Since the theater of absurd talks about the absurdity, it talks about nothingness of life, it talks about the nonsense elements hidden inside human self, and it does not talk about the established standards and parameters, hence nothing stands in clash with each other. And that is why the, these dramas do not talk about dramatic conflicts. You remember we, in the beginning, we talked about conflict to be the spirit of a drama because this helps drama to build up, to make up a structure. Since abstract theater does not talk, to, talk about structure, there is no need of uh, these conflicts, dramatic, dramatic conflicts to uh, present in these dramas. So such conflicts, however, lose their meaning in a situation where the establishment and outward reality have become meaningless. So unless these conflicts are, st are keeping some meaning with human life, they are useless to discuss. Um, however, frantically characters perform this only underlines the fact that nothing happens to change their existence. The theater of absurd talks about the stagnant nature of human existence. It talks about the stillness of life. It says life does not move. It remains the same. Absurd dramas are lyrical statements very much like music they communicate an atmosphere an experience of archety arch um, archetypal human situations since language is given very limited um, uh, you can say a limited use in abstract theater there are several other mediums of um, communication used and music is one of those so you will find lyrical statements in um, these dramas. The absurd theater is a theater of situation as against the more conventional theater of sequential events. So um, if I conclude the previous the points that I have given uh, now regarding the structure and the establishment and the uh, about the conflicts so this can be uh, put under, uh, put down in this statement in a nutshell that the theater of absurd stands against the conventional theater. Conventional theater talks about conflict, talks about dramatical structure, hence it has sequence of events that gives it a beginning, that gives it an end. 
However, the theater of absurd stands against these standard establishment and that is why it talks about theater of situation. Situation can come up any time, maybe the, in the beginning or maybe in the very end. So it talks about the real life and real life does not follow any standard establishment of rules. It presents a pattern of poetic images. In doing this, it uses visual elements, movements and lights. If you happen to watch um, any performance relating to Theatre of Absurd, you will see that there is a lot of light, there is a lot of movement, there, there, are, there are many visual elements uh, used in, in this performance since there is very less of language used as medium of expression. And now we are moving into the, uh, we have, so far we have been discussing about the theater of absurd in general and we also discussed some of the aspect that Samuel Beckett brought in front. Now we are going to talk about the theater of absurd and Samuel, Samuel Beckett's perception of this very form and how we have a new meaning of existence. Uh, by the writer, how he sees the French existentialism and then what kind of art is formed by Samuel Beckett as um, existentialist. How the theater of absurd is seen by Samuel Beckett and how it is conveyed by him in Waiting for Goro particularly. Now we are going to analyze it by looking at the features that he introduces in his drama. Um, the main features include absence of a real story or plot. So if you, after reading now, I, I assume that you would have read the story, this play for twice at least by now. And now by reading, tw after reading uh, for twice, you understand that I couldn't find any story in it or I couldn't find any plot in it, uh, a drama plot. Then this is one of the features of Theater of Absurd. Then if you find no major action, since all actions are insignificant, um, taking on boots, taking off boots, putting, on, putting your hat on, taking it off, uh, moving right, moving left, sitting down, standing up. So you would say, okay, fine, there are some actions on the stage. However, I do not find them significant actions. So what kind of action is there? What kind of body movement is there? If Samuel Beckett is not making use of language, what medium of expression he uses? Because these actions I find insignificant. You may find in the very first appearance, you may find them insignificant, but that is the insignificance of human action depicted by Samuel Beckett and it has its roots in all those influences that we discussed in the beginning. Then you may find the vagueness about time, place and the characters. You will find everything abstract, everything keeping no logic, everything almost nonsense. What is this time? Just now it was morning and now it's starting evening. Okay, after one day you will find it's just night time that uh, passed away and now you're finding that there are leaves on the tree. How come? How come it is possible? In characters you will find one day they meet each other, next day they are telling each other that we never saw you before. So these, this vagueness, this chaos, this ambiguity, this uncertainty is basically idea that is on purpose embedded in this drama and that is among the features of Theatre of Absurd. Alright, the Theatre of the Absurd main features also include these three aspects the values of language is reduced you will as I discussed just now that you will not find a lot of um, uh, dialogue delivery into these dialogues in fact what happens on the stage transcends and often contradicts the words spoken by the characters often the things that they would say um, in the very first instance they won't say anything you will not find any dialogues and if there are dialogues they are constant repetition nothing new is coming up coming up and okay if this is it whatever even they say will not keep any worth because it is not followed by actions there 
we should stop waiting for Godot or we should we should go now but they never go never go we should you know part now we should get separated from each other because but they never do it we should hang ourselves but they never do it right I'm going to get you carrot I know you don't like turnip but they never do it so things even which are spoken by far are not practiced by the characters and that is the that is the um, parody of language that is the distortion of language that is the basically significance of language that has been um, that has been mocked in the play by the writer the language does not play any significant role in human life that is believed by the um, uh, writers belonging the school of thought then uh, another very important feature of uh, this theater is the extensive use of pauses silences miming and farcical situations which reflect a sense of anguish we have also discussed this aspect that since language is not considered a reliable source of communication pauses silences farcical situations are considered potential um, you know uh, mediums of expression and the third aspect is incoherent babbling makes up the dialogue so it again this this element can be connected with um, the fourth element the value of language that first of all you will not find any dialogues secondly you if you find them at all they will be constant repetition thirdly you will find them all together contrast to what actions are so the language is worthless and if there is any language at all left that will be incoherent babbling of the ideas they will not make any sense most of the time there will be contradictions there will be conflicts actors are saying something else they are doing something else they are showing something else however they mean something else so language is the medium of expression language is really mocked by theater of uh, by theater of absurd and now uh, the themes, um, the main themes, although we have also discussed uh, several themes in one of our previous lectures, however, if I categorize them down under three or four main headers, they will come up like the very first theme can be the sense of man's alienation, the desire of uh, being alienated, isolation, staying separate from others. Secondly, the crudity of human life. Thirdly, the absence or the fatality of objects. Fourth, the meaninglessness of man's struggle. Well, if you talk about the sense of man's alienation, you will find though all characters are shown, since there are only two pairs, both of these pairs are shown that each character in a pair is dependent on the other however they are living in their own worlds and they have their own journey their own destination the cru cruelty of human life is shown through little insignificant action when pozo and lucky they both they both fell down and they are asking for help the other two characters are more concerned about their own um, you know uh, situation than of them the absence or the fatality of objectives they are waiting and they are waiting no uh, reason no logic and each day they are getting the same results Godo never comes the meaninglessness of man's struggle is shown by throughout the drama whatsoever struggle they uh, put into their actions is is equal to zero towards the end because they are standing at the same point where they started drama from and then the things that add into the absurdity of the theater we we discuss that in theater in uh, theater of absurd it's not the content but the form is absurd as well and that is the extreme uh, presentation of the idea by the writers who um, adopt this way of um, conveying their message there'll be no setting very minimum objects are used in setting a dissolute country road and bare tree as in waiting for Godot. 
टाइम इज इवनिंग इट्स डार्क इट्स ऑलमोस्ट नाइट कैरेक्टर्स टू ट्रैम्स वेलडमीन एंड एस्ट्रोगॉन बोर्ड बाय अर डे ऑफ नथिंगनेस पोजो एंड लकी सो इट्स all this is all what the drama brings in front however there lies in story of life and a grand story of life so now moving on to the second framework philosophical framework of the drama that shows us glimpse of existentialism now what is this existentialism jane paul sartre calls it that although the form uh, may be absurd but the presentation is of a uh, logic insight the there are beliefs of the school of thought as well and this uh, these writers they believe uh, they believe in only that which we can see that which exist um whatever exist is what we can see right for example plato's essence and um spinoza's substance are out the philosophical window then they talk about the loss of the sense of external meaning they say that there is no external meaning meaning only comes wi from within then loss of belief in reason and faith they do not believe in reason anymore they not, do not believe in reasoning just like the theater of absurd and they lost their belief in faith too religion does not keep that importance to them now what new meanings of existence are emerged then awareness of man's prosperity to evil and conscious of the destructive power of scientific knowledge and these this you can understand is it it has its roots somewhere in the presence of atomic bomb and exercise of this atomic energy um that was a promise to um destruction of many generations to come um the lack of moral moral assurance and the decline of religious faith the disillusionment with both the liberal and social theories about economic and social progress mistrust in the power of reason and the, this all all of these four aspects are basically grounded in a sense of anguish helplessness and rootlessness developed especially among the young so this was the new meaning of existence by the existentialist and how jean paul sartre uh, see french existentialism uh, he saw man trapped in a hostile world and human life was meaningless and this created a sense of confusion despair and emptiness the universe was not rational and defied any explanation so the main component of this philosophical um, current was the french jean paul sartre existentialist presented the absurdity of human condition by means of a lucid language and logical reasoning and uh, the the theory they believe in existentialist believe in there is therefore no pre-existent spiritual realm no soul no cosmic comp compassion for for or interest in human life no afterlife no transcendence of worldly existence no cosmic meta narrative no angels and devils no divine will no present destiny no in inevitable fate nothingness in everything and everything in nothingness that is what believed by existentialism and if we divide these uh, beliefs into few categories and if we try to find these categories in the text of waiting for go waiting for godo these will be um, life is reflection you will find act 2 is reflection of act 1 one character is a reflection of the other character so life is reflection existence is reflection can be can be uh, understood as one of the themes of the play life has no pre preset or external meaning of its own it is just a reflection it keeps on replicating
The myth of Sisyphus, life is without human creation of it meaningless. It is meaningless. Free will is important. You need to have free will. The theme of choice. Humans therefore are free. Free will is important. Third is truth and fact. Humanity's only chance at dignity lies in truth. So these are the beliefs shared by existentialist. And what is this, this myth of Sisyphus basically? Um, it's the courage to face the truth that we are alone in an uncaring universe. That, that, that desire of isolation. I can't go on. I must go on. I'm going. This is a dialogue from the play. The courage to face the fact, possibility that life is meaningless and yet to still go on. And this is the very theme, the very spirit of the play. The courage and dignity of Sisyphus when at the top of the hill he sees the rock roll back and realizes his meaningless and yet still goes down to set to work again. And the similar kind of situation you will see in the characters. The courage to face the fact that tomorrow it may be the same situation again and go to never come. However, possibility they are looking into is waiting and life is meaningless and yet they are still going on with that. So, uh, after these two discussion based on these two frameworks of philosophical background that include the theater of absurd and existentialism that we can very much find in this play and this play is basically based on these theoretical frameworks. The third aspect, the third direction we need to understand is the paradox of consciousness. And there are two possible interpretations of the existence of human consciousness, a divine gift or a cosmic joke. How it is defined? A divine gift is basically defined as fire of the gods, part of the divine plan. Consciousness brings us all our joy, its love, its art, etc. And a cosmic joke, consciousness was never intended for humans and brings us only suffering, pain and the existence of evil. These are two different philosophies about the paradox of consciousness and basically this is paradox of consciousness. One group of people be believe this a divine gift and this may bring joy to human life. However, uh, the other school of thought calls it a source of pain and suffering and um, this reminds me of a uh, of a proverb as well that ignorance is blessing. So some people call knowledge as the true spirit of life and some people may call ignorance as blessing because knowing things put you in difficult situation and brings pain. So uh, what we discussed so far, we discussed uh, the philosophical background of the play that uh, primarily include three directions, three dimensions, theater of absurd, existentialism and paradox of consciousness, knowing about things and not knowing about things. If these characters would have known about the, this fact that Godot will never come, probably they would have not wasted two days of their life. However, it's good that they did not know about it because if they would have known, they would have done, they would have had nothing to do even in these two days. So in both situation, it's a paradox of consciousness. Now, uh, what social acceptance uh, Beckett's work has, uh, his plot is obscure, obscure and non-consequential. His setting is symbolic however bear his themes are meaningless of human experience stage direction repetitive and frequent in language everyday but meaningless and if we try to analytically map our characters we find there are these two characters Valdemir and Astragon are complementary two pairs and Lucky and Pozo are linked by a relationship of master and servant. However, Valdemir and Lucky represent the intellect, the intellect side, the conscious side, the divine gift of consciousness side of the paradox. On the other end, Estragon and Pozo stand for the body, the unconscious self of reality. The two couples are mutually dependent. The character 
The two tramps are waiting for is Godo, biblical allusion in this name. So, if we look into Estragon's character, Estragon is one of the two protagonists. We understand that he is a bum and sleeps in a ditch where he is beaten each night. He has no memory beyond what is immediately said to him and relies on Vladimir to remember for him. I am just giving you a recap of the ideas, although we have discussed all these ideas in our discussion so far, but just to put them together in, under Estragon's character so you can analyze the character in detail. Um, Estragon is impatient and constantly wants to leave Vladimir. However, is restrained from leaving by the fact that he needs Vladimir. He is depending on Vladimir. It is Estragon's idea for the bums to pass their time by hanging themselves. Estragon has been compared to a body without an intellect, which therefore needs Vladimir to provide him with that. On the other end, Vladimir is one of the two protagonists. He is a bum like Estragon, but retrains a memory of most events. So he works as brain for him. However, he is often unsure whether his memory is playing tricks on him. Uncertainty, chaos. Vladimir is friends with Estragon because Estragon provides him with the chance to remember past events. Vladimir is the one who makes Estragon wait with him for Mr. Godo, Godo's imminent arrival throughout the play. Vladimir has been compared to the intellect which provides for the body represented by Estragon. Lucky's character. Lucky is the slave of Pozo. He is tied to uh, Pozo via a rope around his neck and he carries Pozo's bags as well. Lucky is only allowed to speak twice during the entire play and his long monologue is filled with incomplete ideas. He is silenced only by the other characters who fight with him to take off his hat. Lucky appears as a mute in the second act. Now the character of the boy. The boy is a servant of Mr. Godo. He plays an um, identical role in both acts by coming to inform Vladimir twice uh, about Mr. Godo's message that he will not come and he will not be able to make it tonight, however surely come the next day. The boy never remembers having met Vladimir and Estragon before. That is again um, a trick of consciousness. He has a brother who is mentioned but who never appears. So contradiction of language. Basically conflict between language and act. Uh, Pozo is the master who rules over Lucky. He stops and talks to the two bums in order to have some company and pass his time. In the second act, Pozo is blind and requires their help. He, like Estragon, cannot remember people he has met. His transformation between the acts may represent the passage of time where, where he gets blind. So, this brings us to the discussion question, although I, in my last lecture I did talk about many of the questions that you can consider um, based on our discussion of these lectures. However, for this uh, lecture you can um, particularly talk about how is the place title Waiting for Go to related to its theme. Now when we are finished with our themes discussion, where in the previous lecture I talked about almost all of the themes and today I have I've given them some major categories, you can, you are ready to talk about themes on your own. So point out religious allusion and linguistic reference in the play. How is Waiting for Godot an absurdist play? So we discussed about these things in detail. So I would want now to start your uh, putting your notes into details to form your reflection. So what we discussed in our today's talk is basically we discussed the philosophical background formed by Samuel Beckett for Waiting for Godot where we discussed all three dimensions, theater of absurd, existentialism and the paradox of consciousness. And then we also touched upon, um, uh, you know, uh, the characters of the play to see how we can analytically map them so you can start writing your, start designing your character sketches as well. Let's see what we are going to ne uh, discuss next. We are going to uh, analytically map the social significance of this play that I touched upon today, but we'll definitely be discussing in detail in the coming talks. 
And then we'll also discuss the philosophical backgrounds um, and we'll have um, a discussion, uh, more detailed discussion about themes, the social themes, the psychological themes, and the religious themes. However, I would want you to complete your notes about the themes, um, whatever we have discussed so far, taking your reference from them, and then match your notes with the discussion we are going to have in the next talk. So let us see how far we are able to um, uh, reach the uh, similar kind of understanding. And we will also discuss some dramatic references from the play that will again to substantiate um, the themes that we have taken out of the play. So this was all for today. Quite a lengthy, a lengthy and heavy lecture, heavy dose for you. Um, inshallah, we'll see you in the next lecture. Allah Hafiz.